Welcome into another edition of the Blue White Breakdown brought to you by Penn State Health. Dustin Hawkins with here with Daniel Gallon once again. It's Penn State Michigan week. We're also talking some Penn State basketball with them getting their season off the ground this week as well. We'll start with the, with the obvious Penn State big matchup against Michigan uh, at home. Noon kickoff this Saturday. Daniel Gallon, what uh, did you make of the fact that Penn State is a favorite in this game? Let's start right there. They opened the week as a one-point favorite. The suggestion, I suppose, being that home field advantage uh, makes all the difference in this one. Yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting, um, especially when you look at kind of Penn State had that three-game losing streak. And even though Michigan had suffered its its first loss uh, a couple weeks ago, it was in impressive fashion and a couple a couple calls go one way or the other and it's a completely different result in that Michigan Michigan State game so I was a little bit surprised but at the same time I think when you look at the styles that these two teams play where you look at either side and neither offense is going to light you up uh, barring something unforeseen I mean Jahan Dotson might light you up individually Blake Corm or Hassan Haskins might do that um, for Michigan but you're not going to get kind of that full uh, assault offensive assault from from either team so it's going to be one of those games like a big 10 game fought in the phone booth where you know one thing here or there will probably be the difference and I think that when when you're looking at that line sure being at Beaver Stadium for the helmet stripe game um, you know I think that people are, are given that a little bit of something it's a nooner so it'll be interesting to see what the energy is like the only noon games this year were Illinois, have been Illinois and uh villanova was that noon i forget um I yeah i think it was, was yeah. <laughs> it's been a long season it's all blurring together at this point i get it uh it really is so i think that that's kind of what you look at uh, on the margins i feel like we've i've said this about every kind of big big 10 game where oh this one will be decided on the margins but this is the one where that's very true <laughs> not just a little bit true for this one it's a very true for this game uh and i think um you know, a little tip of the cap, I think, from Vegas to Penn State, just with what they were before things went sideways and what it looks like they could be the rest of the way. Maybe a little bit of a knock on Michigan for not having a murderer's row of, of teams and, and not being dominant in some of those games now wins are wins so you have to kind of reconcile that but what to me it would say there's a disconnect between how. Um, odds makers view both of these teams and how the college football playoff committee views both of these teams. Got the, the, the committee has a thing for Michigan to, for 10 days after Michigan losing to Michigan state for them to be ranked ahead of Michigan state uh, kind of defies what they said previously about what head to head matchups meant. And I, I understand the timing of losses, how impressive the other team is or was that beat you. I get all that stuff, but it was, that was one of the more striking things I think of this list, this list of rankings from the college football playoff committee, which I felt like in my view, since they started doing these, these were the biggest joke of any weekly rankings. And I think there's a lot of contenders for that. Yeah. I mean, I was watching that on Tuesday night and I, we talked about this a lot last week. Turns out I was really wrong about what would happen with Penn State. I was convinced that they were going to end up in the top 25 so that when they play Michigan, you get the chance to have Michigan as another ranked team, as another ranked win. Um, And then afterwards, Gary Barta's comments about how the committee still views uh, Penn State as as a very good team, uh, where you still have Wisconsin, you have Auburn, you have these other three lost teams that they beat in there. um, And people, you're thinking, oh, well, you know, maybe you're, you're still holding the Illinois loss against Penn State, which I think a lot of Penn State fans are still holding the Illinois loss against Penn State fans. But then you look at it and Illinois beat Minnesota, who was the number 20 uh, team in the first college football playoff ranking. So doesn't that make that loss better? It, you can just go down the rabbit hole. But I was pretty surprised that after the first rankings, it seemed so predicated on head to head that suddenly it's well Michigan's a more complete team than Michigan State I mean Michigan State has played some pretty some some clunkers like that Indiana game that was very you know that was really dicey uh I mean but then Michigan has had the Rutgers game I mean I think that none of these teams are consistent so there's no consistent way to kind of uh stack them up uh in some order but I was surprised to see Michigan ahead of Michigan State, especially when it seemed there's going to be such an emphasis on head-to-head uh, early on. 
The only consistency I think in these rankings is the lack of consistency and the subjective nature of them. And they are what they are. I mean, it, the joke's on us for taking them seriously. If, if we are, which that ship should have probably sailed after this week. But the <laughs> other thing is they, they do get stuck on a position on a certain team. And for Penn State, they're stuck, stuck on a certain position that they're horrible because they lost Illinois. I also think that sometimes it's not even as complex as that. It's, it's that they lost three games in a row recently. And mm-hmm. these other teams have won a bunch of games in a row. Wisconsin's won five in a row. So that just like looking at the schedule and seeing W's instead of L's, I understand that that is kind of what this whole thing is all about. But I think they they have um, really there, there's a recency bias maybe towards that, and I, I guess it's natural. But the bottom line is the the playoff committee they, you know, their Penn State's going to have their chance, and they're going to have the number six team, they're going to have the number seven team. So when it's all said and done, but I think it just marks the mountain that they have to climb to get into you know the top. 15, 12, 10, wherever they want to be at the season, at the end of the season. And, you know, you can say that these are not um, meaningful rankings if you're not in the four team playoff mix, but they are meaningful when it comes down to uh, being picked for bowls and stuff at the end of the year too. Yeah. I think that that's, especially when you look at Penn state, is that you're really kind of, kind of trying to game out the pecking order to see what bowl game could they be in? I think the, the Rose Bowl, I saw some, there is something I saw that there's some, still some pathway for Penn State to get to the Rose Bowl, depending on um, how many, if a Big Ten team makes the playoff, how many Big Ten teams make New Year's six games, that there's there's a way for that to get the the floor, I guess, to get risen up. Um, Citrus Bowl, you need, you need some things to happen. Um, and I think that that's kind of the, you know, it's like, it's kind of the, the opposite of at the end of an NFL season or NBA season where you say like, Oh, they're, they're playing for draft position. Whereas now Penn state is kind of playing for that, for that bowl bowl position. I mean, do you want to spend that last week of uh, December in New York, or would you rather go to Las Vegas, Florida? Um, I think Phoenix is an option. Um, or do you want to let the bottom fall out and go to Detroit? Um, that's kind of the, what, what you're playing for at, at this point of the year. And those rankings, they play a part in that. And I think that, you know, maybe it's something we shouldn't take as seriously anymore, but the implications are all there. Um, especially when you think about people's jobs, amount of money for these programs is that you have to pay attention to them. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with the people that think we should, discount the AP poll and the coaches poll for, for myriad reasons. I think that everything is kind of, everyone loves to talk about having all these data points. And I think that those polls are are good for that. The college football playoff poll is an interesting exercise. I think that that's kind of the the best way to look at it um, because the season doesn't end today. Um, So you just kind of got to file it away. Maybe there's something that down the line that you know, will make sense from a reference point. Personally, I was happy to see UTSA uh, get into that top 25 roadrunners. And I did think it was cool that Purdue um, was able to get into the top 20. (laughs) It is very funny to see that little stack of Big Ten West teams uh, that stayed the same, (laughs) or there are still three Big Ten West teams still in that range. Um, But I mean, just seeing different names in there, that's kind of what I look for. That's kind of the interest that I try to find. And I think you made a good point last week about trying to just manipulate these rankings to, to get the outcomes or the situations that they want, which, you know what they say about objective rankings, that's, they should only be used for manipulation that so the, but that's an interesting point. I think it remains true with the big 10 West. Let's talk about this game coming up. Penn state, Michigan uh, mentioned before Penn state, a one point favorite um, going in. What do you see in this matchup? You know, there, there are some obvious, I think, keys in, in this game, but what are you looking for, you know, for those margins, as you mentioned before, uh, what are you looking for that, that can really determine the outcome of it? Yeah, I'm really interested in seeing the Michigan defense. Uh, we'd seen Don, the Don Brown defense for so long. He's one of the, the best at what he was doing uh, for a very long time. Obviously, things kind of ran their course at Michigan. Uh, and then you bring in Mike McDonald, who's a 34-year-old, uh, from the John Harbaugh tree. Um, and I think that when you listen to what people have said and you read about the Michigan defense this year, it's a little different. There's a little bit more disguising things. And 
it's really opened things up for some of those defensive ends. Obviously, Aiden Hutchinson was already a, um, you know, a big time player coming into the year, but David Ojabo has had a really, really big breakout year uh, on the defensive side of the ball. So I think that's interesting, especially when you talk about Sean Clifford holding onto the ball, taking unnecessary hits, and whether Rasheed Walker and Caden Wallace can really, really hold up on the edge, especially Wallace. So I think that that's something that I'm really interested to see, at least on on that side of the ball. You look at the the rankings uh, for defense, and the Michigan defense is, has been really good this year, and the Penn State offense has been fine. Uh, some spectacular moments from John Dotson, uh, some big plays from Keandre Lambert-Smith, Parker Washington, the tight ends here and there, but that's about it. And one thing that stood out about Ajabo and Hutchinson, and, and it kind of speaks to what James Franklin said this week, is that those guys on non-passing downs, I think, have combined for half a tackle for loss. So the 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 havoc that they're wreaking is – is strictly in, in passing situations. And I, I haven't watched them enough to really speak to how they do or don't defend the run. It's just what the stat sheet is saying, but it does support the idea that balance is going to be as important in this game on Saturday as it's been in any game so far, they have to find some kind of way to establish some kind of threat on the ground and not, be in these bad situations. I think it's promising that in back-to-back weeks, they've shown a lot of improvement on third down, but I think that work has to continue. And I think the, the little glimpses that we saw of no Kane looking a little springier and uh, Kevon Lee, eight carries for 50 yards last week, you got to take small victories wherever you can get them in this run game. You know, those need to compound and they need to be built into something bigger because Michigan has to respect this run game or it's not going to be a favorable situation for, for, for Clifford. I'm along those lines. I'm also looking to see what's Penn state doing when it comes to its tight ends and running backs and how are they going to provide support if Rasheed Walker and or Caden Wallace needed on those guys. Yeah, Sean Clifford's thrown the ball 99 times in the past two games, which is uh, a very large number, uh, even in the way that college football today gets gets a little pass happy. It's not something that we've seen at at Penn State very often. So I think that that'll be that'll be pretty interesting to see. Um, Obviously, everyone knows that you have to have a plan to stop Jahan Dotson, but he's really kind of come on strong the past two weeks after having a couple quiet games here and there. So I think that when you look at the Penn State offense, like, I don't know about the run game. I mean, there's three games left in the season. You're getting those glimpses of Noah Kane, uh, Kevon Lee. Maybe you do a, maybe you just do three drives in a row where you just try to pound it with one of those guys and see what happens. And, you know, in a game where there might not be a lot of points, you kind of just try to do something on one of those drives just to add something else to think about that maybe you can come back to later to set up something. Um, but I'm not holding my breath to see a hundred yard game on the ground. Uh, Cause it hasn't, it didn't happen against the Maryland defense. Uh, th- there's not a lot that makes you think it can happen against this Michigan defense. It's true. I mean, putting hope in, in that rapid turnaround, no matter what Jay Wan Sider had to say a couple of weeks ago, I guess I'm not I'm not fully buying it, but they need they need to do something there, I think. And and ultimately, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I see this game playing out is kind of like Wisconsin and kind of like Illinois, where it's like, can the Penn State defense hold up close to its own goal line for long enough to for the offense to get a quick strike or for to mount to mount that drive, because you know, they're not going to do, they're not going to move the change with a ton of consistency because they haven't done that in a lot of games this year. So I think you're going to see some three and outs, some ugly three and outs and and biding time until they can strike quickly or or break a big play or get Jahan Dotson open. I think that will happen, but it's just going to come down to can, can Penn state be on the, on the field for 90 plays? Can they give up? 250 300 rushing yards and still give their offense a chance to to mount a few drives and win this game yeah i think the wisconsin comparison is is really good that was a 16 10 game um i'm not expecting to see that many more points uh here especially when you look at the the penn state defense especially the secondary um cade mcnamara has kind of been that that game manager uh, except for the michigan state game but I don't see the Penn State secondary kind of uh, letting that kind of game happen. So I think it's going to come down to the defense is going to get it stops. I think that that's the thing that it's shown over and over again this year is that 
it's it's going to get it stops and you only need to score 21 points basically with this defense to win 20 points um and so it's just on the michigan or the penn state offense just to get that you know no matter how you get it whether you get something on special teams maybe maybe you get the defense another touchdown that jair brown pick six makes that 31 14 looks at maryland looks a lot better than 24 14 um, so I think that that's something that you're going to really have to watch. I think the defense is, I think the defense is going to get it stops. It's just whether the offense can, can take advantage of it and then avoiding kind of getting into that, uh, punt punting battle, uh, like they had against Iowa, obviously the circumstances were different, but obviously it's kind of, a uh, a boring cliche to talk about field position, but. I mean, that, that field wasn't flipped against Iowa. That field was folded up and just miniaturized. And I think that that's kind of what the offense has to do. The offense has to get its 20 points and it can't afford to get backed up uh, and have the field just shrink and shrink and shrink because the defense will do whatever it can, but there's going to become a point where it, it breaks. Yeah, and I think, you know, that one and, and Iowa, that, it's a good comparison. You, you could see falling into this pattern um, against Michigan too. The difference being, obviously, take Juan Roberson, just no shot to to free himself from his own goal line. So it just perpetuated that cycle. I think Penn State will be better equipped if that happens this time around. I've got Penn State winning it. Uh, I, I picked 24-21 in the predictions that, that went on Penn Live today. I think I was one of two. I think Joe Hermit picked a Penn State win too. Easy to pick Michigan. Um, it's easy to see them having success with with their bread and butter with that Illinois game in mind. But to me, I mean, it comes down to they're going to make it tough in the red zone. Is Cade McNamara the guy that you barely ask to do anything? Is he ready to rise into that occasion on the road in a tough game? That that means a lot. Uh, I, I'm I'm really looking at this Sean Clifford versus Cade McNamara matchup and 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 going with the Penn State quarterback on this one. Yeah, I went with Penn. I went with Michigan twenty-four, Penn State eighteen. Uh, I don't see Penn State hitting that twenty-point threshold. Um, I think that. I mean, I probably don't have a good case for Michigan scoring twenty-four points, but just kind of going into the game, that's just kind of the, the the beat I got on it. I think that Michigan is is really solid and and really complete, even though the offense is kind of unspectacular and with Blake Corum's status being a little up in the air that kind of changes the shape of it a little bit more but I think that Penn State is gonna have to force Michigan into mistakes and Cade McNamara for his part has kind of shown that he's a little he's mistake averse Um, he's not going to necessarily make a bunch of plays but he hasn't really lost them any games so I think that that's kind of what what I factored into and I think that Penn State has just kind of shown this season that it's just so kind of fragile uh, in terms of everything kind of has to, it's hard for them to win when something isn't working or something goes wrong. And I think that Michigan is a team that can cause something to go wrong. And the maddening nature of all this is you could very well see a game that's like 16 to 16 with three minutes left, that there's a pick six or a ball bounces in a funny way. And those are the exactly the kinds of margins you're you were talking about earlier is that, you know, the the score can be deceiving just as it was a little bit last weekend against Maryland. Uh, before we sign off, just Penn State hoops and your, your impressions of, of their first win of the season. Uh, they beat Youngstown State. Uh, slow start. I think uh, Micah Shrewsbury said gritty, not pretty. And I think if you look around college basketball and the number of teams that struggled against these lower level teams, you you will take gritty, not pretty at this point in the year. Oh, yeah, there are some a couple of results that uh, that I saw uh, the past couple of days or have been like, oh, well, we're, we're doing this now. Uh, Navy beat UVA like. OK, um, but yeah, Penn State 75 59 over Youngstown State. Uh, Seth Lundy and Sam Sessoms were the the offensive catalysts. Um, Lundy had when when Lundy's on, he can fill it up with the best of them. He had 23 points. Uh, the big thing for him this year is going to be consistency. Um, I think last year he had two 30 point games and then a bunch of games where he was only in single digits. Um, and then Sam Sessoms uh, had a big game um, in his first career start uh, at Penn State. He transferred in from Binghamton 
for the 2020 2021 season. He scored 14 of his 17 points in the second half. He's just a really fun player to watch. Undersized guard can get to the hoop easily can shoot it from the outside. Um, and then John Hara had 16 and 14, just kind of a, a workman like outing for him underneath. So obviously you could see some of the things that could cause problems for them in the big 10 schedule and the front court is thin um, forward, Greg Lee, uh, a transfer from Western Michigan, who there's a lot of excitement about his right foot was in a boot. Um, so we'll see how long he's out. Uh, Giovanni Scott, uh, a junior college transfer has some NCAA red tape that he's working through. And so then you have that leaves John Hara and Jelani White, who's a transfer from Canisius. Um, that's kind of your, your only two big men. And Hara picked up an early foul. White battled a lot of foul trouble, but has really long arms. <laughs> that was the biggest takeaway from watching Jelani White. A lot of length um, can kind of cause some problems underneath for opposing forwards. So that'll be something to watch. But I think that this is a team where, Obviously, it's the first year of a rebuild, but at the same time, they're a veteran team. There's a bunch of 50-year guys, a lot of guys that kind of know what they're doing, and a lot of guys who can be fun. And I think that that's kind of what you want um, out of a team like this. Lundy, Sessoms, uh, Harris entertaining the watch, and then Jalen Pickett, uh, Sienna transfer. Could He struggles struggled a little bit, nine points on three of 10 shooting, but I think that he's someone who could as a candidate for a 25 point game down the stretch. So it'll be, they play at UMass on Monday, which is an interesting non-con game. Um, but Bryce Jordan center had basketball in it last night. That is, that's a fair takeaway. That final takeaway right there <laughs> is, is to the point and short and sweet and Penn State basketball is back. And I think it, it comes back in a way that, you know, people just have some guarded expectations. And I think, you know, progress will be the number one objective to see this Penn State group come together and maybe see some of these guys prove like a, if Seth Lundy, for a good example, emerges as, as a really good consistent threat this year, like that's, that's a major victory for this team. And you're just kind of buying time for Shrewsbury to get to really fully, instead of scrambling to put a roster together, doing that with some diligence. And with that in mind, they also announced this week, uh, you know, the highest rated, recruiting class in Penn State basketball history at number 16 I believe in ESPN uh, Jameel Brown was a centerpiece of that group he's a six foot four guard number 90 prospect in the 24 7 sports rankings Michael Shrewsbury said he should have a major long-term impact the kind of player that he's going to want and need to build around going going into the future yeah the re recruiting class is pretty impressive um, there are no scholarship freshmen uh, on the Penn State roster this year. They didn't sign anyone in the 2021 class. So it's a the roster is going to is in a really weird spot kind of where they brought in all these fifth year guys that are going to be one and done uh, through the transfer portal. And then next year, there's going to be a pretty big youth infusion. But you've got two big men uh, in the class and Kevin Jai and Demetrius Lilly. Uh, and then you have some interesting guard pieces, Kanye Clary, uh, a point guard from Virginia, and then Jameel Brown from that from West Town uh, in Philly. And then Evan Mahaffey uh, is a small forward from Cincinnati. So it's a it's an interesting group. Obviously, the way that recruiting rankings work when you have this many guys in a class, it really bumps you up. But at the same time, when depending on what you look at, um, like Jameel Brown's recruiting ranking fluctuated a little bit, but at the time of his commitment, I think he was the second best uh, commitment in Penn State history of the, the rankings rankings era behind only Tony Carr in 2016. Um, Kevin Jai is up there too. Evan Mahaffey is a top 15, I think, prospect that's ever committed to Penn State. So this is what you need. <laughs> you need to have players. You need to have guys that can compete in the Big Ten. It's a rugged conference. It's hard to win at Penn State. Um, it's hard to win in the Big Ten in general. So Michael Shrewsbury is, is trying to build something. And I think that when you combine a win like this, um, albeit against Youngstown State, albeit in the season opener, uh, and having this on, on signing day, it kind of sets you up for what's going to happen now and then what can happen in the future. Couple W's on signing day, the win over Youngstown State 
and the recruiting class that offers some promise that this young core can come together. Also in the transfer era, there's a good chance that he can surround these young guys with a, another couple of veterans to help keep this ship stabilized going into the future. Penn State basketball, as you mentioned, back Monday at UMass. They're back home Thursday, uh, next Thursday, against St. Francis from Brooklyn, so you can keep an eye on that. Obviously, big game coming up, Penn State football versus Michigan. Saturday noon kickoff. We'll see what happens in that one. That's Daniel Gallen. I'm Dustin Hawkinsmith, wrapping up another edition of the Blue White Breakdown. Check out Daniel on Twitter, at DanielJTGallon. You can find us at PennLive.com slash Penn State football, and pretty much everywhere podcasts can be downloaded. Thanks for tuning into the Blue White Breakdown, and we will see you next time. Thank you.